a KQED HD production. In California's Cuyama Valley, an hour southwest of Bakersfield, an unwelcome visitor lurks in the potato fields. Yep, that is a nymph. That one is active. Grower Brian Kirschenman and his crew are looking for tiny pests called potato tomato psyllids. The insects, both the young nymphs and the adults, are as small as the comma on a computer keyboard. But they wreak havoc on potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, 40 crops in all. In potatoes, they suck the plant dry. And what's worse, the pest can also transmit a disease that ruins potato chips. Despite the bad rap they get from nutritionists, potato chips are a $6 billion business. When infected potatoes are fried, dark streaks appear on them, which is why this disease has been dubbed zebra chip. I visited entomologist John Trumbull at the University of California, Riverside, for a private tasting. Some of them come out with wonderful patterns. <laughs> But unfortunately, what's happened is instead of starch, they have sugar in the vascular system. And when you cook that, it turns it brown, and the consumers send it back. Yeah, a little burnt tasting. As a result, they've lost many millions of dollars in Texas, California, and Washington State. So it's the, it's, it affects both the, the color, the taste, and the shelf life. Exactly. Are you finding nymphs or adults? Kirschenman grows thousands of acres of potatoes here and in neighboring Kern County, where the crop is one of the county's top ten in value. Kirschenman was the first California grower to find zebra chip disease in his potatoes in 2008. I did end up losing one field and um, tried everything to make it work. And it was, I got to a point of just saying, move on. It was a, probably a quarter million dollar hit. California has had these psyllids for more than 100 years. What makes them a new problem for growers is that now they don't just live here during the warmer months, they also spend the winter. Our temperatures have increased by two to three degrees Fahrenheit, and that seems to be enough to keep them from being frozen out during the winter or chilled out during the winter. I suspect that global warming is at least playing a role in this particular insect spread into California. Around the world, scientists are observing similar changes. In Spain, the European grapevine moth is flying out earlier in the summer and reproducing more abundantly than it did 20 years ago. On Tanzania's Mount Kilimanjaro, malaria mosquitoes are moving farther up the mountain. And in Japan, a pest called the green stink bug that damages rice and soybeans is expanding its range northward. This is not speculative, this is not uh, something that we would predict, this is what's happening now. But how did Trumbull know he was seeing something new? His detective work began in Irvine on one of his test fields for tomatoes. So this was the scene of the crime, so to speak. And this is the very field where we discovered the psyllids were overwintering. Back in 2000, when he discovered that psyllids had spent the winter near this field, Trumbull knew it was bad news. Okay, what do you got? One adult. It meant the pest could begin attacking crops early in the growing season. When a grower puts in their crops, they're already there. And that means it's much more dangerous for the grower because early infestation in a crop oftentimes leads to much more damage than if they occur late in the crop. So if you think about how an insect, for instance, might overwinter, it can overwinter as an egg, as a larva, as a pupa, as an adult. When it's time for it to begin its development in the spring, it's using cues from the environment. If the season gets warmer earlier, that gives it that much more time to develop, that much more time to eat a plant, that much more time to produce another generation. To figure out if spending the winter in California was a new behavior for the psyllid, Trumbull turned to the historical record. He was lucky that scientists in California have been collecting psyllids and making detailed notes about them since the 1880s. One such collection is preserved at UC Berkeley under the supervision of entomologist Peter Oboisky. This is a drawer of cockroaches, crickets, and walking sticks. The psyllids are part of the collection's six million insect specimens. Whoa. 
About 300,000 of them are being painstakingly photographed to help scientists research how climate change may be affecting insect behavior. So these are psyllids that have been collected in California in the 30s and 40s and 50s. And each one is noted what plant it was collected off of as well. So oh. that's also in these notebooks. If you look down here, the host plant is, is noted. What the, the time of year was to know is this showing up earlier, is this showing up later. So that's, that's the kind of information we can get from the specimens themselves. Using this kind of information, Trumbull concluded that this was the first time the psyllid had overwintered in California, a behavior the insect had never displayed before. Every 30 years since about 1900, it's moved into California. And we would find it, it would be here for six months, it would be here for a year, and then it would disappear, presumably because it got too cold. That pattern changed radically in 2000, with the psyllid spending the winter in Irvine. Then in 2004, tomato growers discovered the pest had overwintered in Hollister. In 2012, in the Washington, Oregon, Idaho area, where half the nation's potatoes are grown. And that same year, it appeared in Manitoba, Canada, early in the growing season. As temperatures warm up in California and across the United States, these insects will be able to overwinter further and further north. Meanwhile, down south, a farmer's worst nightmare has already materialized. In Mexico's Baja, California, psyllids destroyed 85% of the tomato crop in 2001. Partly in response to the new pest, growers have moved much of their production inside screened enclosures. It's mid-July, and Kirshenman is preparing for the harvest. For potato farmers, the really insidious thing about the disease carried by this bug is they don't even know they've got it until after they've planted, irrigated, and harvested. And on this one farm, for example, we're talking 1,200 acres of potatoes. This is the moment of truth when Kirshenman will find out if his potatoes in Kuyama Valley were infected with zebra chip disease or spared. The potato grows from a potato. So as for potato seed, it's, your, it's very important to have the cleanest of all clean seed you can. These are nice. There's zero issues in these. But Kirshenman is concerned about other possible repercussions. This seed is grown for, um, for Central America. These go down to Guatemala and the Dominican Republic. So if this becomes a bigger issue and countries want to um, stop importing potatoes because they found a zebra chip, or that's my biggest fear. In fact, just a month later, South Korea banned all potato imports from Washington, Oregon, and Idaho out of concern over zebra chip disease. The ban is costing producers some $8 million. The field where Kirshenman had found psyllids turned out to be lightly infected with zebra chip. So keeping psyllids out of his fields is now more urgent than ever. Spraying for psyllids increases California potato growers' costs by about $75 an acre. See how she's now kind of pushed her abdomen out? Yeah. Back at UC Riverside, Researchers like Sean Prager are looking for an alternative to heavy spraying. Their goal is to keep the psyllids from feeding on crops by dousing plants with smelly oils or covering their leaves with clay. Then there are also things where we can change potentially how the plant looks to the insect, um, by color or by making it look older or younger. The right combination of these factors will make something unappealing to the insect. As soon as they start eating, they run the risk of transmitting a disease. So if you can avoid them feeding at all, that's a far more elegant solution than having to kill them every time you see some psyllids in the field. Since the 1970s, scientists and growers in California have dramatically reduced pesticide use in many conventionally grown crops. Tomato growers, for example, cut spraying by half in the 1990s. There are huge advantages to the people in California. Less pesticide use means less concern by the consumers for pesticide residue. We use less fossil fuels. We have fewer volatile organic compounds that appear in the atmosphere. It reduces smog. It's, it's a real win-win-win for everybody in California. But warmer temperatures and the pests that thrive in them now threaten to undermine these gains. 
So if you have an insect with multiple generations, you get more generations. If you get an insect that occurs early in the crop, it will occur earlier in the crop and faster. So all of these things are desperately in need of additional research.